Um, this is uh, expanding the crossroads and rapid grants in the case of Kenya. Uh, so let's see. Um, is uh, we're we're talking about the rapid grant project, and we're talking about, and I believe that Maureen, no, Ruth is going to discuss the circle and what the circle is. Unmute yourself, Ruth. Remember. The first time each person speaks, I should probably introduce themselves. Yes, please, Ruth, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ruth, Ruth Amway. I am uh, currently a student at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, sorry I couldn't join you in person, uh, but I'm happy to be a part of this team uh, uh, and then to present on our rapid grant. So just to follow up on the question about the circle, I'm just going to do a brief uh, uh, basic uh, introduction of what, what it's about. Uh, Rosalind, are you sharing the screen on your end? Yes. Ah, okay. Okay, good. I'll just uh, go on from here. Okay. So the circle was founded in eight, uh, 1989 um, uh, through the vision of Mercy Amba Udioye, the beautiful lady in the picture. Um, she, uh, alongside a couple of uh, other women, sort of envision this uh, Pan-African Academic Association of Women who research, publish, and engage with communities uh, primarily on issues relating to religion and theology. So the main uh, uh, focus of the, the, the work and their research really is to investigate how culture and religion, how it affects women's lives, and how you know those can be interpreted to um, become um, avenues of empowerment for women uh, and their, within and amongst their communities. It was, um, the circle uh, currently is organized around uh, continental uh, centers. So it's broadened even beyond uh, just the continent of, of Africa to mostly uh, um, here, in the, here in North America, it's, uh, mostly around the African women diaspora, African women theologian, uh, theologians in the diaspora. Uh, so it has this continental reach, it has regional riches within the continent, uh, the five regions of the continent. And then like uh, Dr. Talisia mentioned, it's, uh, there are centers across countries, but then also within institutions uh, as, as well. Um, so mostly these are run by co uh, coordinators who are responsible for sort of mobilizing members within that fall within that uh, particular space, um, either institution regionally or country based. Um, but then they also are responsible for, you know, the whole project of mentoring uh, younger or upcoming um, uh, circle members. So our rapid grant sort of picks up from the big uh, circle of concerned women theologians. Um, that brother umbrella and focusing on uh, the chapter in Kenya um, specifically. So the next slide picks up on, you know, some of the issues are uh, that sort of gave birth to the brother vision of the circle and why uh, research is um, uh, writing and publishing is essential to the work of the circle. And part of it has to do with the uh, colonial and imperial um, experience of, of uh, the majority of the African continent and, of course, other parts beyond uh, Africa, where basically, um, you know, uh, prior to, but mostly within, within the 19th to the mid 20th century, there's just a seizing of social, political, religious, cultural, and just economic, not, I mean, just name it, all kinds of domination and exploitation on the continent. And part of the problems that came out of that is just uh, the ways in which um, um, indigenous knowledge systems were um, mostly suppressed and sort of uh, um, with the interest of just expanding the European vision, right? So um, there was, um, um, an emphasis on 
sort of westernizing this uh, context and this community. So to a large extent, those created uh, systems of that were mostly focused on men and masculinity. And, um, you know, it reinforced aspects of patriarchy that were uh, in existence in some areas. And it's uh, primarily just pushed women to the uh, to the fort, to the back, back shield and um, you know, just systems that um, sustain a hierarchical existence between men and women, right? So such that the marginalization of women pretty much just became the overt way in which people do life. Uh, so that's that's part of what created uh, the rationale for the for the or, and the concern for the circle of women. Uh, the, the circle. And so now it's formed itself primarily into a gender centered, interreligious, interdisciplinary, and um, primarily like a transformative association, really, that seeks to subvert this colonial and imperialistic uh, frameworks uh, and reintroduce um, um, structures and systems that allow for women's uh, perspectives and women's ways of knowing and being to uh, emerge from uh, this local context and, and sharing that with the wider world. Um, yeah, so that's just a brief overview. And I think Rosalind will talk about how circle fits into the broader vision also of women in religion. Right, so the RAPID grant is a combination of two groups, women in religion and the Kenyan group of the circle. Um, we were founded in 2018. We began working with Kenyan scholars in 2021. Uh, it was very difficult work to do because they did not have uh, any uh, uh, data packages and it was very expensive to get individual data packages. And so people were paying to come and work with us on Wikipedia. And so that's the rationale. One of the rationales for the grant was to train more Wikipedians and expand them. But the other was to underwrite both, uh, the majority of the money went to underwrite um, data packages and to pay for a coordinator to find a group of committed uh, Wikipedians. Um, just to let you know, rapid grants are on a yearly cycle. They're up to 5,000 US dollars. They can give you extra money for conversion. And uh, they're pretty, I don't know if they're easy to get. We got ours the first try. Um, and but you can't go to your second one till you've written your first report. But then you can have a rapid grant and go for another rapid grant after the first cycle. Um, so I'm going to turn this over now to Maureen. Introduce yourself. I'm Maureen um, with the circle. I was coordinating the rapid grant uh, project that we worked on. Uh, to write on to what Ruth and Rosalind have said, the project was titled Expanding Wikipedia Editors in Kenya, and it ran from April to July of 2024. So the main aspects of the main focus of the project was to recruit and train editors on Wikipedia editing, and then develop new articles, improve existing Wikipedia articles on the circle matrix. These are women... Um, in the circle who have excelled in their respective um, fields, either academic, religion, or even as activists. So we had a criteria on how we would select uh, the, the circle matrix on the articles that would develop. There were already existing articles, so we identified which ones needed to be improved on. And to do, uh, to, uh, we did that so that other Wikipedians can then enhance uh, the biographies of the women one thing we um, learned pleasantly about the Wikipedia articles is that they grow every day. And then also to highlight and amplify the voices of circle matrix in Kenya with the available uh, circle resources. How did we work? We selected notable circle matrix or women for the compilation of new articles and improved the existing ones. Our approach, considering the time that we had and what we needed to accomplish, we set up teams so that we could develop the articles 
and would work jointly on one sandbox and would uh, distribute uh, tasks so that each one of us in, in the four teams knew exactly what part of, of the article they'd be working on. Then the other thing that en enabled us to really um, shorten the learning curve was peer-to-peer -peer learning and support to address the challenges that we had. Because sometimes while you're compiling your article or sourcing or trying to do citations, there are challenges we could face. And so therefore we depended on one another within the teams to learn from one another. And considering that we come from diverse fields, we're able to harness on one another's uh, expertise. Then we also had scheduled meetings for updates on progress. This went really well because we met every Wednesday for an hour just to review what we had done and also to just uh, share uh, where we may need additional support. And then also we addressed our differences in communication styles to enhance learning between the Global South team and the team in, in the US. So that's how we managed to pull through what we accomplished within the months of the rapid grant. Challenges. I think this is Ruth again. Yes, it is. Um... Yeah, so just uh, going back to what I was saying about uh, the process of colonization and some of its impact, uh, one of the biggest issues uh, that you know pertains to what we're talking about in Wikipedia is just um, how structurally imbalanced it is, um, such that a lot of African countries continue to be like the basis for both natural resources for you know what we need to have something like Wikipedia um on online and uh, even manpower but access to um a lot of this remains very minimal right um so like rosalind was saying the key challenge one of the biggest challenge that we had working on this was um access to internet internet access uh, that took a ton of the money that we had um just paying for that the high cost of it uh, and, and, you know, just trying to navigate that with uh, the cost of time and, um, you know, other things that draw your attention here and there. So that really was the biggest issue. Um, and, and people who work, um, all of us who were working were primarily as volunteers, right? So there's a difference between those who are paid to work on uh, Wikipedia articles and all uh, from those who, you know, volunteer their time to edit um, so that is sort of pointing us to some of the things we'd like to share, even as we speak about our experience in this and some of the challenges to the broader Wikipedia team, how we might, you know, rethink uh, accessibility and just the functionality of it so, such that we have more people from um, outside of uh, European and Western countries being able to, um, you know, share their stories and, and speak of and, and highlight people within their communities. And um, one of the things we're thinking about is, you know, is how possible it will be to have, to be able to work on Wikipedia offline. To an extent, that's going to increase the number of people who are able to participate. We had some people drop off from, from our team because of, um, you know, some of this uh, internet related challenges. Um, we know that there's some kind of work that we can do on Wikipedia offline, but to a large extent, um, how good you are of, of an editor depends on how many edits you sort of have, right? So. Uh, in order to have more edits, you need to be online more, right? Um, so how possible it is to uh, be able to access Wikipedia and, and you know, make one's contributions in an offline state um, or, um, um, and then for those to actually be counted uh, also as, as your time on Wikipedia, as, as your time working on Wikipedia articles. Uh, and then also just thinking about some of the, you know, structural uh, functionality related things like, you know, accessing the wiki comments, the consenting process, how we could sort of rethink those and make it more accessible, more um, open, friendly uh, in ways that people who have limited resources can still be able to get on Wikipedia and, and, and um, you know, add those important stories that need, need to be added. Uh, and the last thing that we'll mention 
from a list of so many others that we would have if we had more time. Um, is just accessing the wiki library as well. And, and, and if I think you have to have a certain threshold of edits to be able to do that. Um, so being able to, you know, just rethinking that because when people rarely, when people are not able to have as much edits, it limits because they can't get on the internet, it limits what they can do, right? So how might we rethink those numbers, those figures of who counts as, you know, having done uh, a lot more edits than others and, and paying attention to where they're coming from and how those um, can be limiting. Uh, and, and lastly, you know, how might we rethink even the grant and uh, granting process so that we are able to um, be able to fund things beyond uh, uh, that, that might be helpful in, 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 in uh, for, for folks outside of uh, in this context to be able to access Wikipedia, how, how accessible are the grants, right? What, what are the limits and uh, the, what, what, what can you do with the grant monies? What is accepted and what is not? What might be certain things that might be, uh, the grant monies could be used for, useful in this context that uh, we, we might need to rethink. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ruby. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, citations and sources is uh, Christine? Oh. No. Oh, uh, is this you too, Ruth? I Citations think um, and... it was under, I think it was Maureen, the slide. You? Yes, it, I it's apologize. me. I apologize. I can't see who's doing which ones. So Maureen, if you could just go into that a little bit. Thank you. All right. Let me go into the challenges, specifically on citations and sources. Um, Ruth has highlighted the need for having a reliable internet uh, access in order to work on Wikipedia. But the other you know, challenge that came out uh, that we encountered was the fact that there were limited online resources for the women that we were writing articles on. And this had certain financial implications in terms of that the, you know, of sourcing the books and articles which are in hard copy, but then would require travel to actually access them and, and all that. So that was, um, quite a challenge. And then secondly, some of the available primary sources are, are not accepted on Wikipedia. And then uh, oral sources and oral, oral histories are also not considered as valid. And yet um, some of the libraries would have some of those oral sources, but for purposes of uh, citation, we couldn't work with that. And then the issue of notability. In the, con in the Kenyan context, sometimes when we did the articles, uh, what would be defined as notable for Global South was sometimes viewed as promotional. And then lastly, uh, we have limited recognized publishers in the Global South. So some books that are published you know, in the Global South may not count as authoritative or credible sources. So that then would bring in the challenge of this citation is not good enough and therefore you, you need to look for uh, you know, a, a more authoritative uh, source. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Change in strategy. I believe this is you. Uh, no, it's Christine. Christine, come on. My laptop, real quick. Give me a minute. Um. Here she comes. <laughs> Thank you, Rosalind. Can you just press the button? The, okay. Hello, my name is Christine Meyer. I'm from Moscow, Idaho. My username is Figure Skating Fan. I'm a longtime Wikipedia editor. Uh, my first edit was back in 2007. Um, I guess you could call me one of the founding members of the Circle Wiki Project. I've been involved with it since almost the beginning. Um, despite the fact that I'm neither African nor a theologian, but the generous and kind members of this group accepted me into their group anyway. Oops. So we were, um, and in addition, let's see, oops, sorry, there we go. For example, 
One of the ways that's been most apparent um, to me is the fact that the group members changed the t actually changed the time they met for their weekly edit-a-thons, just for me. Um, as we've already said, the different time zones, I don't know if it's already been said, but different the different time zones between here and the different time zones in the US and in Africa has been a, kind of a challenge. Um, I live in the Pacific Daylight Time, the West Coast of the United States. Um, so originally their meeting was at 6 a.m. Pacific Daily Time, Daylight Time, which totally conflicts with, with breakfast at my house. Um, something I couldn't get out of because I caretake for my two with severely developmentally disabled adults, uh, adult children, who I care for at my home in Moscow, Idaho. And uh, I mean, I feed George during that, my son George during that time. It couldn't, couldn't be changed. But the circle group wanted my participation because I kind of act as, the, as a, an, the experienced editor of the group. Um, that they moved the time of their edit-a-thon to two hours ahead. Um, and to better accommodate their schedules as well, as well. But still, so the these highly accomplished scholars who are meeting this morning and academics did that for me. Um, it's been such an honor and privilege, even associating with them and even and being even a small part of their group. I found through my involvement with the circle group and with women in religion that I get a, a lot of enjoyment and satisfaction, mentoring new editors and sharing my experiences with them. Uh, my own values of positivity and supporting others fit with their circle's values. They seem to get my challenges caring for adult children and have done their part in accommodating. Like I said, it's been a privilege and honor. So in addition to mentoring new editors, I've also done some administrative tasks for them. I've helped create their project page, cleaned up a work list, and created the first drafts of their logo and project banner. Um, but my favorite part has been helping them to learn how to edit. Um, so this is some of the things that we've done. Um, the important thing of moving to stops. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Do you want me to move on? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. There we go. So this is an article on uh, Hannah. Kenodi, which Telesia worked on, and we had the challenges all of that we've talked about before. Um, and this is actually her very first article that she created. So we were in an edit-a-thon and uh, over Zoom, and we worked on it to, to get it ready, and we published it, or we helped her go through the process of publishing it. And First article published, woohoo, we all remember what that's like, right? How exciting. And we celebrated, and then not uh, five minutes after we closed the meeting, she got a notice that it had been moved to draft space. <laughs> and so, so it was very, we went from excitement and happiness and joy to uh, dejection and sadness and, and kind of disappointment. Um, and the other thing on top of that is that the person who moved it over to the pay to draft space accused her of of a conflict of interest and even paid editing, even though we explained to them that you no know, Telesia was found out about about Dr. Kenodi because. They sh ended up sharing the same office in the university where she worked um, at University of Nair Nairobi, but 20 years apart. It took us like two times to explain that. And, and to, to this editor's credit, they were very generous and they, um, um, they said, oh, I apologized and helped us eventually get it back on um, into article space. But you can see it has the bad the, the template up there, so that it reads like a an advertisement. And and they're gonna uh, folks are gonna talk about some of the cultural issues around that. Um, 
And so be, out of this experience, we, <laughs> out of that experience, we went, we're not doing what we needed to change our strategy. So we started to go from, to publishing full completed articles to publishing stubs. So finding, like they do in Women in Red, that's how they create a lot of their new articles and bios. You find three reliable sources that are without the compromise, and then you put it over, you publish the, publish it, and, um, and, and so I also put on there the don't bite the newcomers. I mean, that's really important, especially when you're working cross-culturally. And then that's when we went to working on uh, publishing stubs at first, and then somebody can come over and come alongside and or after you and work on expanding it further. Um, thank you. Yes. Thank you. And, uh, and I think I'm going to need you to help me get this big again. You? You? Slideshow. Okay. There we go. Got it. Okay. okay. All right. Um, the values learned and Colleen. Hi, I'm Colleen Hartung, and I've been part of the Women in Religion Project from its beginning at the 2018 Parliament of the World's Religions in Toronto. Being part of the Kenyan Grant Project was a privilege, as many people have said. Getting to work with the Kenyan participants has enriched my Wikipedia working style and my life. So I'm going to start by reading through the grants, the, the uh, values learned in the rapid grant. So communality is a circle value, which involves working in teams. Knowledge is co-produced. Communication is a process that must be worked on and lived into continually in order to build trust. Transparency of values, processes, and materials is a must in order to build trust. And sharing is not transactional for Wikipedia learning but rather is about culture, priorities, and values. So I'm gonna take the values one at a time and share a little bit about what I learned. So communality, it was clear from the beginning that communality is a foundational, non-negotiable circle value. Kenyan participants worked in teams from the start, cooperating on edits in shared sandboxes. The focus wasn't on the number of edits, but on cooperative learning that accommodated each person's pace and comfort level. So communication. We were communicating across cultures. Members of the original Women in Religion Project had to learn to listen carefully so we could recognize and embrace unfamiliar styles of learning, writing, and working together. Maureen was very good at patiently explaining and advocating for ways in which the Kenyan participants worked best together. Transparency. It was very helpful for me to be able to actually see the way Kenyan participants work together in the sandbox. This transparency helped to shift my value about sandbox ownership and how I might work together in that space and all the different Wikipedia space in a more cooperative way. Sharing is not transactional. Creating a learning space that accommodated different cultural styles for sharing work was actually a really good experience for me. It helped me, it helped me to have a few people in the project, in the Kenyan project, reach across our culturally different ways of working um, to help us to understand that difference makes a difference, that difference is important, that we need to hold it up, that we need to support it um, and advocate for it. So anyway, I'm, I'm grateful and thankful for the project. And now another faithful Wednesday. It was Wednesday morning for us. And, and in Kenya, they were having their second meeting Wednesday afternoon. And when came to everyone, Colleen was at most, and Christine, when we changed the time, she was able to come. Hi, everybody. My name is Wynne Whalen. Um, 
Rosalind had asked our group to sit in and contribute to the meetings with the women theologians from Kenya. So I began to attend the weekly meetings at 10 o'clock central time every Wednesday morning and at six o'clock for the Kenyan time. We'd meet with three or four of these women from Kenya for an hour who had been writing, these women had been writing and publishing for years. And the more I listened and learned about what they were doing, I was more and more amazed. I began to realize how insular we are and I'm still learning a lot about these women who know and support one another uh, through this circle that they have. And they're not only from Kenya, they're from various countries in Africa. It's such a shock, really, <laughs> a new window opening in our awareness of what is going on in the world. I'm remembering that years ago, um, I went to Kenya on safari, but of course, we didn't know anything else that was going on except for the animals, you know. So I am just delighted to open my awareness to these women and to see what is going on behind our backs that we didn't know about. <laughs> Thank you, Wynn. I think that uh, she beat, y'all did your time very well. Um, so... Let me move to the next slide. And I guess I just want to say one thing is that if you're not changed in this process, you're not doing it right. Because when you work with another human being, you should be changed by that human being. And that's one thing these women have taught me. Um, the accomplishments. And so I turn this back over to Maureen. Thank you, Rosalind. Thank you so much. Uh... Wen and uh, Colleen for sharing so beautifully about how it was such an enriching experience. And with a very conducive and uh, an environment that allowed us to be open and vulnerable, this is what we accomplished, 49 meetings over four months. And this is, you know, different types of meetings. But you can imagine 49, if you were to divide that over the four months, it's like 10, 10 meetings a month. And then 10 Kenyan editors successfully trained. We bonded as a team and worked to the end of the rapid grant. And we still have a WhatsApp group. We still communicate. Uh, somebody asked the other day, you, you guys are all quiet. Again, what we achieved, we actually compiled four new articles, which are out there. And it's such a good feeling just to go check them out and find that they're there and, you know, they're growing. And we improved six existing articles and we developed two stubs. But we were pleasantly surprised when a stub was overqualified to be a stub and was moved to an article. And so that was quite something, and we celebrated that. And then we had over 2,500 user contributions, that accumulative figure of the edits that we were doing over that period. And the skills, I've just summarized, but there were many, just uh, getting a username, log how to log in, uploading photos, that was quite exciting, being able to upload, learn, learn how to upload photos. And then sandboxes and creating new sandboxes for every article that we started working on. Each one of us would have their sandbox, but we had a common sandbox where we all worked in, which was really nice because you could see what the rest were doing. But the info boxes was very interesting, you know, putting the info box. And we always celebrated when we managed to do that and have a photo. And, you know, the photos not quite, but, you know, putting the info box was a highlight. And then general formatting, the headings, the subheadings, um, joining up the sentences, clearing words that uh, maybe are a bit too um, superfluous. And then the citations, that was very interesting. You know, sometimes when you got your citations straight on, you got very excited. And sometimes when you were like, you have to do it the hard way, uh, the manual, then you'd struggle and then you'd call somebody and say, please help me put up this citation. And we did that together, linking internally and externally. Those were real highlights, just a summary of some of the skills that we developed. And also to add that uh, we got uh, quite interested in, you know, wiki uh, writing articles in Wikipedia and, and did a few on the side that were not necessarily related to the rapid grant, but, you know, just testing out to see how that would work. And then definitely a much better understanding of Wikipedia requirements. If we were to measure from the beginning where we 
we were like questioning what is objective, what is authoritative, what is credible. I think now we are home and dry in terms of understanding the requirements for Wikipedia. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. I think, uh, come on. Um, we're ready for a Q&A. And the African Circle, uh, this is the website here. Um, let me move this up a little bit to show you. Um, the project site, we'd love anyone to join us, add their name to the project site. And when we begin other things, well, you can join us. And uh, are there any questions? Uh, Hillary. Ken, what the issue was with the Wiki Common consent process and what you would like to recommend be changed about it? Um, uh, Ruth, do you want to answer that? Because you're the one who brought that up. I thought that was interesting. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, the, repeat the question is what the issue was with the Wiki Commons and getting approval for a photo. Uh, I think one thing I recall is there was a bit of back and forth um, trying to get, you need this to get that, you need to, you know, just the process of it. Uh, and, and it seemed a bit long and just required one to be on the internet a bit longer. Um, so that's factored into um, access uh, uh, to the internet. If there's like just one form you can fill out, but it seemed like you need to do one or two things, you know, this person needs to get that, you need to get this from this other person. Um, it just makes the process a bit longer. Especially with third party approvals. I mean, you can get your own picture up. Uh, but Maureen, maybe you want to talk too about matriarchs and their hesitancy. Well, yes. Um, it's very interesting that on our end, um, some of the metrics were not very excited about having their photos out there. Um, and, you know, for a, a whole range of reasons like, well, is it really significant? So it took quite a bit of persuading to to work on that and just to emphasize that we're working on bridging a knowledge gap. We're working on bridging a gender gap and having your photo accompanying your article is a big plus because then people actually get to see who this person really is other than just reading about them. But as time goes by, you see that there's a greater appreciation of the value of having the photos uploaded. So we've even talking about, talked about having some information sessions for living matriarchs to kind of show them other African women who are online with their photos. So to overcome that barrier. Um, any other questions? Oh, Adam, and he's going to. Hi, uh, what um, I think Ruth said about uh, access to the Wikipedia library program was interesting. I hadn't considered um, the minimum criteria of having 500 edits and a certain number in the last 30 days would be a disproportionate burden on people without um, easy internet access. So I'm, I'm sure the people who came up with those criteria hadn't considered that either. Um, uh, something to think about might be what would a more fair criterion be for someone in that situation because they still probably want need to limit access to you know people who have demonstrated they're serious about working on it but the edit count isn't a fair way so is there a fairer way I'd almost want um, Colleen to discuss because I think Ruth brought up that maybe edit numbers isn't the best way to show engagement with Wikipedia. And uh, I think that Colleen has been discussing this to every person she runs into in the hall at this conference, uh, because a lot of us are working very hard on Wikipedia, and we don't necessarily like, there were 2,000 edits from from the women in uh, Kenya, but the U.S. group only had 236 edits during the four month period, well, the May to really August that we were working.
because we were training, but we weren't necessarily editing. Um, we wanted them to do the edits. And so we were trying to get their edits up. Uh, so, um, Colleen, do you want to come up and discuss that? Well, I would want to understand what the necessity is of limiting the access to the library, because my guess would be that there isn't that much traffic to the library. So, um, so there's that. That's the number one question that I would have. Like, really, does it have to be used as an incentive to get people to edit more? Maybe if we're really trying to be an open access, open knowledge space, that the library is just a privilege of signing up to be a wiki editor and, and trying to edit. So that's number one. Number two, probably in this grant, it should have been written in, and maybe the next grant from the beginning, that they are immediately given access to the library. It's just part of the, the, um, the privileges of the grant. Um, so that is on the grant side. On the other side, um, there are those of us who are doing a lot of administrative, a lot, not admin work, but administrative work for our projects, all the various things that are going on for our projects, the research that is involved. I spend my time researching probably average, probably 10 hours a week for stuff about Wikipedia, but it is not going into edits, it's going into the book project, or it's going into outlining the next project or this project. And my work would be much, I mean, I do have access, but what I have to do is, oh my God, I got to get my edit count up so I can get access in, which is a ridiculous thing. It's a ridiculous hoop to make me jump or anyone else jump or the women in the Kenyan project jump in order to do really important work for Wikipedia. It's ridiculous. The, the other thing is uh, Ruth applied for a scholarship and they said they based all the scholarships on the number of edits. Okay, she's worked four months twice a week with this group plus some additional work and plus this, this what we're doing today. And I'm not sure, again, that just this random number of edits is a good idea. But I do believe that with grants, because you're, if they're giving you a grant, they know you're there, you have deliverables, that with grants you should automatically get the library. And the point of the library is that a number of us have university libraries. So we're behind the paywall. But if, I don't. but there you go. Um, Colleen is not behind the paywalls that gives you scholarly articles from the people we're researching. And so that is one of the points is to find the secondary sources uh, that we need. And if you don't have access to that, that's a problem. Uh, so Hillary, a long answer to a short question. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Mike. Forgive my ignorance about the IP, IT situation in Kenya. Have you approached providers about donating access time? Did you hear that? Have you approached providers about donating access time? Uh, Telesia or Maureen, either one of you? Well, um, I, I could take that and uh, probably Maureen can just come in. I, I think we have, we used to have just one provider for internet, that is Safaricom. <laughs> and uh, just, uh, is it beginning of this year, Starlink came in. So there was monopoly and, you know, of uh, access. And so, you know, going to them, I, I'm, I'm not going to them because actually working in the university and even the university is having challenges uh, you know, of the internet and they, they couldn't just uh, donate even to, you know, these academic institutions. Uh, I, I don't know whether I would really have a higher chance of getting uh, data donation, but uh, Maureen can come in. <laughs> Thank you. No, Tilicia, you're very right about getting um, 
donations from the internet service providers, it's a business for them. And so negotiating with them, I think we're just, we're so little that they wouldn't consider, you know, we're not a big organization for them to actually consider giving us possible, you know, um, extra time on, on the internet. And uh, Stilicia has said, yeah, that there's been a monopoly for a while. And so if you're to get reliable internet, then you have to pay up for it. I think the bigger, okay. another big question is what's in, what's in it for them, right? So <laughs> uh, unless there is some kind of partnership or benefit that they get uh, in relation to Wikipedia, which is uh, sort of what we'll be fronting, that it's um, highly unlikely to be able to... Maybe with the... Uh, maybe that should be a stipulation with the Nairobi event that they start to do something, you yes. know, from the Wikipedia Foundation. Yes, that will be very... Starts to demand better. that they do something. Thank yeah. you, Ruth. That was a, a kind of a clever way to to approach them. Any other questions? We're about to wrap up. And I am so appreciative of these women coming on in their Sunday evening, uh, a number of them, but also Ruth's Sunday at Princeton, which we know what students' workloads are like. So, and I appreciate everyone who came and I appreciate everyone who's online. We're streaming this and I do believe it's recorded. So this is a great thing for all of us. Thank you very much.